bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan, and Trillium Health Partners. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. Hi, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Doug Maynard, the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today we're going to be uh, hearing a presentation called There is No Simple Answer. Uh, highlights of the CPS statement on antenatal counseling and management for anticipated extremely pre preterm birth. Uh, and CPS, in this case, is the Canadian Pediatric Society. So this is a presentation that we're going to hear about uh, a recent position statement that, uh, that the CPS produced and sort of give some background and where it came from and, and really hopefully have a conversation that, in fact, there is no simple answer in this, uh, in this situation. It's very... A sensitive and often highly emotional situation. Anyone who's worked in that in the NICU environment, I'm sure, has is is aware of these kinds of situations. And and many of you, I'm sure, have participated directly in these conversations with families, which are, uh, of course, often very emotionally charged. Um, so today we're going to be hearing from two uh, two of the of the individuals who participated in the development of this statement and who have uh, extensive experience in the NICU environment working with uh, uh, premature uh, uh, infants. Uh, first, we're going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Brigitte Lemire, who, who has been a member of the departments of pediatrics at CHEO, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and the departments of gynecology, obst obstetrics, and newborn care at the Ottawa Hospital, uh, both in Ottawa, Ontario, of course. Uh, she is also currently co-leading in initiatives aiming to better provide better counseling and support to parents at high risk of delivering extremely prematurely using a shared decision-making framework. And Dr. Lemire has been a member of the Fetus and Newborn Committee at the Canadian Pediatric Society for the last uh, uh, two years and has been involved in updating and creating several of their position statements. And joining Dr. Lemire is Dr. Gregory Moore, who is an academic neonatologist practicing at both of the hospitals in Ottawa that have level three neonatal intensive care units, uh, that being CHEO, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and the Ottawa Hospital. He's also an associate professor on the clinician teacher track through the University of Ottawa, and he's a clinical investigator with the CHEO Research Institute and the Ottawa Hospital uh, Research Institute. So uh, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to Dr. Brigitte Lemire and Dr. Gregory Moore. Over to you guys. Thank you. It's our pleasure to be here this morning and to present this uh, controversial and uh, not easy topic. The objectives of this session will, are as follows. We wish to discuss the three main purposes of the statement, which are to promote consideration of the multiple prognostic factors and prognostic uncertainty in every case where we counsel families under 26 with gestation. We want to discuss what, it, it, what shared decision making is and highlight the excellent communication between families and healthcare providers that must take place. And we also want to describe the process by which the statement was developed because it is a little bit unusual compared to how usual CPS statements are created. And uh, just so you get to know both of our voices here, uh, I'm going to step in now for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. And again, I'm uh, Greg Moore. And you're going to very briefly meet three babies during this presentation. And this here is a picture of Madeline. And she was born weighing 630 grams at 24 weeks and one day. Her parents needed extensive support uh, to decide the best care option for their daughter. And they settled on attempting intensive care 
aware that they may later change to palliative care if she had major complications that negatively altered her prognosis. Uh, thankfully for them and for Madeline, uh, she did very well and is now a thriving three-year-old. So extremely preterm infants uh, in developed nations are generally considered to be those born between 22 weeks and zero days and 25 weeks and six days. And the new CPS statement applies specifically to this gestational age window. Uh, there, there are other situations, of course, in neonatology where one could envision the application of some of the statement's recommendations, meaning there can be situations either antenatally or postnatally where there is uncertainty as to whether intensive care or palliative care is in an infant's best uh, interest. For example, uh, much of the statement could apply to consultations with a family regarding their baby at 26 weeks gestation, who, while in utero, is noted to show minimal growth since premature rupture of membranes at, uh, say, 17 weeks gestation. But again, to bring you back to the statement's targeted population, it's this gestational age window of 22 weeks through 25 weeks gestation, and we are speaking specifically about antenatal decision making. And the rest of the talk and anything we discuss will be targeted towards uh, this population and purpose. Now the decision making we're speaking about regards several broad options. Uh, the parents, with the support of the healthcare team, will have to choose one for their baby. The choice may change, uh, but if their baby is born extremely preterm, an initial choice needs to be made so that it can be provided. Uh, ideally, this decision is made in the hours or days prior to delivery, uh, rather than in minutes, uh, but we all know that can happen. So broadly, the management options as listed here are palliative care and early intensive care. So palliative care is where the baby would be supported and loved through being held, kept warm, provided with sucrose, and having no painful procedures until he or she dies. And the literature suggests that in nearly all cases, uh, these infants would die within minutes to hours as they need, at a minimum, respiratory support to survive their first day of life. Uh, parents would need to know that in nearly all cases, once palliative care is instituted, uh, one can't then convert to early intensive care as the chance for survival or having no neurodevelopmentally, neurodevelopmental disability uh, would be notably lower. Now, the other uh, broad option is inter early intensive care, which is where the baby would be supported and loved through being provided intensive care measures with the goal of survival. Uh, the intensive care measures would generally, as a minimum, include respiratory support, uh, that being through CPAP or intubation with mechanical ventilation, uh, and intravenous access. The measures may also include chest compressions and epinephrine, uh, if required, and that would depend upon decisions made by the parents with the support of the healthcare team. Parents would need to know that, of course, early intensive care may not be successful and their baby could still die uh, or survive with neurodevelopmental disability. And there is actually really one more uh, sort of broad option uh, that's related to both early intensive care and palliative care. And it's what I'll call uh, the default option. And it is mentioned within the statement, but perhaps not as uh, explicitly as the other two. And the default option uh, is where the parents truly can't decide between early intensive care and palliative care. And therefore, when born, uh, the infant will receive one of the two options based on the healthcare team's decision or the institution's policy uh, based on the infant's expected prognosis and what is believed to be the best option uh, that is in their infant's best interests. So clearly this situation is uh, ideally avoided, uh, but uh, it certainly can happen, and I'm sure some people in uh, the crowd have, uh, have experienced that. Now, what about our decision-making environment? And I'm gonna put up some questions in a moment here to consider and ponder, noting that the answers can certainly change based on one's present time and culture amongst uh, other influences. So is it ethically justifiable to limit potentially life-sustaining therapy? Or ethically justifiable to provide it in certain situations? How is the decision around this made? Is it by the best interest standard and its limitations? Is uh, there a clearly identified group where treatment can justifiably be withheld? Uh, or where treatment can justifiably be enforced. 
and importantly, who decides? And these questions and the thoughts around their answers show the uh, complexity uh, of this area in neonatology. And we believe uh, this who decides question brings up uh, an important point, uh, that there is a lack of moral authority regarding definitive lines or yes, no answers to these questions. So a parent isn't necessarily right or wrong, and a healthcare practitioner isn't necessarily right or wrong. And we believe that this uh, very importantly has to be recognized uh, during the process of decision making. So a systematic review by uh, Guy and Aol found 34 guidelines uh, and their findings highlight the uncertainty involved with the topic we're discussing today. So the guidelines came from one of 47 uh, pre-selected industrialized nations and they looked for five recommended options within each guideline with the last recommended option being no recommendation uh, seen within the guideline. And uh, we can discuss the definitions of their options uh, later if you wish. So overall, as uh, you can start to see here, there's a wide variation in the recommendations. So at 22 weeks, palliative care was commonly recommended, uh, but there were still some recommendations for what they called individualized, uh, the individualized option. At 23 and 24 weeks, there was division between three of the options, including uh, the addition of one called parental wishes. And then at 25 weeks, early intensive care was the most commonly recommended option, but there were still some recommendations for the parental wishes and individualized options. So given the potential for these different approaches, uh, some do advocate for specific guidelines for uh, your one's country or one's institutions. And I want to end this with a bit of a particularly strong uh, call for guidelines that came from Dr. Messenger in 1995. Now, the background here is that he was a dermatologist in Michigan. And in uh, early 1994, his wife was potentially going to deliver at 25 weeks gestational age. They spoke with a neonatologist, they requested palliative care, and they thought it was agreed upon. Uh, but their son was shortly thereafter born and unknowingly was intubated. And uh, when Dr. Messenger found this out, uh, he asked for some time alone with his baby. He was given this. And during that time, he actually removed his son from the ventilator. And uh, his son uh, became cyanotic and the medical team came in. But then they made the choice to not reintubate. And uh, this uh, young boy, Michael, died a few hours later. Now, Dr. Messenger was actually charged with manslaughter, but he was acquitted by a jury in early 1995. And the quote here that uh, you probably read by now reflects what he saw during the trial, that there was no agreement as to when it was okay uh, to withdraw or withhold life-sustaining therapy uh, in extremely preterm infants. And it's fair to say that today there remains no certain standard of care on this subject with regards to uh, extremely preterm infants. Now, aside... Uh, from the other quote, uh, this again from Dr. Messenger at the trial and those following uh, the case came a really strong call for guidelines, but not guidelines with firm recommendations of a specific gestational age cutoff or degree of illness severity or specific prognosis of neurodevelopmental disability, but ones with an eye towards involving parents in the decision-making process, as you can see by the bolded portion. And this is particularly for cases where the data and clinical situation does not provide a clear, uniformly acceptable treatment that is obviously in the best interests of the infant. And it's with this type of a guideline that we have tried to go with the CPS statement, both in its development and its final content. And uh, now over to Dr. Lemire as you gaze at some of the beauty of Northern Ontario. So many factors come into play when patients consider a health-related uh, decision, and uh, particularly when parents consider a postnatal management plan for their unborn, uh, extremely premature infant, the following factors generally come into play. So survival to hospital discharge is one main question that parents have when we meet them prenatally. How will my child do when he or she grows up? What complications can I expect, which falls into the broad category of neurodevelopmental disability, or NDD? What kind of quality of life can we expect? And another important but non-medical consideration is what we'll call the social familial factors, and I will detail those a little bit later. 
We'll talk about survival first, and I want to first highlight how society can influence survival. This is a paper that's already more than 10 years old from Japan. Uh, it um, it re re reports survival to discharge from the NICU for the whole country, 297 units. And back in 2005, you can see that about one-third of babies born at 22 weeks were, were reported as surviving at uh, discharge, which, is, was, which was completely unheard of uh, in North America. And we see re regularly publications that describe different, very different survival for different gestations based on the country or the continent that the publication arises from. Similarly, there is a lot of hospital practice variation within the same country. In this eye-opening paper uh, from uh, Rissavi and colleagues from last year, they report very fluctuant um, intervention uh, for babies born extremely prematurely in the NICHD neonatal research network. On the x-axis, each vertical bar is one of 24 different sites. And for each gest gestational age, we can see a huge variation in the proportion of infants who actually receive active treatment in the delivery room. So as low as zero to 100% at 22 weeks, and fluctuating between 25 and 100% at 23 weeks. The difference becomes smaller at 24 to 25 weeks, but this fluctuation uh, in active intervention accounted for 78 and 75 percent of the variability in survival and survival without impairments at 18 months at 22 and 23 weeks gestation. The following slide shows uh, the most up-to-date Canadian survival data. An important thing to notice is the denominator used. So different publications will use a different denominator. What we chose to use was um, the denominator being infants who received early intensive care, because we feel that this is what parents want to know. If you try, what's the likelihood that you are going to be successful? So this is data for six years, and one can see that at 22, under 23 weeks, essentially survival was reported approximately at 18%, 41% at 23 weeks, 67% at 24 weeks, and roughly 79% at 25 weeks. Now, one of the limitations of this data is that not all infants were included, only those who were admitted to a CNN site, which still represents the vast majority of extremely small, extremely low gestational age infants. But everybody is in there, singletons, multiples, boys, girls, small or big for gestational, gestational age, those who received steroids and those who did not, inborn and outborn. So the degree of precision is not there when one comes to counsel families, and we have to say that it is an approximation and not an exact figure. For the audience in our region, the Champlain Lynn, these are the numbers for the last seven years uh, in Ottawa. So one can see that out of uh, five uh, attempts, we have had one infant survive at 22 weeks gestation. 36% uh, survival at 23 weeks, 60% at 24 weeks, and 74% at 25 weeks, which are similar to uh, CNN numbers. We have much smaller, uh, a smaller number of patients, so a wider confidence interval. So we have to explain these data and the limitations to parents that it is not a precise value. The other factor that we hear about, on a, you know, almost in all the, of our prenatal consultations is how is my child going to do when he or she grows up. Um, the definition used to define neurodevelopmental disability are shown in the table here. Um, these, these are the definitions most commonly used in the literature. They're not all encompassing, but they usually represent the main disability perceived by healthcare practitioners and their parents as creating lifelong, potentially difficult challenges for children and families. And severe NDD tends to render a child highly dependent on caregivers. Now, to be classified as having severe NDD, a child must have one out of the four conditions in the far right column. To be considered as moderate to severe NDD, a child must have one of any of the eight different 
boxes that you can tick the condition. I want to point out that an IQ under three, uh, more than three standard deviations below the mean means that this child requires highly special school to achieve some basic learning and communication and self-care. And an IQ between two and three standard deviation below the mean means serious school challenges and possibly the need to repeat school years. So these are significant, for lack of a better word. There's obviously issues with these definitions. What do they mean and to whom? One of the things I stress out to parents is that there's actually no consideration in there for whether a child has one or multiple different disabilities. A child who is deaf and cannot be corrected is, is found or said to be to have severe MDD similarly as a child who is wheelchair bound because of a cerebral palsy with severe cognitive delay. So this is one important limitation that needs to be explained. And there are, are some concerns regarding the labeling. Um, moderate, while well, moderate or even mild might not, might, not, might not jive with parental views and their reality. And is there really a correlation with quality of life? Uh, I think that people look at these things differently uh, and it's not clear uh, how one or multiple disabilities may or may not affect the family and the, their condition. So in order to try to gather the best possible data on this risk, knowing all these limitations, uh, several of us here a few years ago was performed a systematic review and meta-analysis of the literature. And this is the short version of months of work. We um, found nine cohorts that corresponded to our criteria. They looked at children born less than 26 weeks once they reached the age of four to eight years. What did the survivors, how they were? Um, nine cohorts from around the world, none from Canada. And as one can see, uh, very, very few babies at 22 weeks in that whole systematic review, only 12 of them. So any numbers that are produced there are unclear whether they really mean something or not. However, the numbers grow for each further gestational age. So at the lower gestational age, you have wide, we had wider confidence intervals, and we had smaller confidence intervals of more heterogeneity in the older gestational age. So I'll let you read the numbers, but roughly what we found was that there was no difference between the weeks of gestation for the risk of severe NDD. Let's put the 22 weekers aside because there's only 12 of them. But for moderate to severe NDD, there was a decrease of about 6% of that risk for each passing gestational age. And one of the, the key features of that table is what's written under the table, is that most children have no or mild NDD. Uh, and then mild NDD does include neurobehavioral difficulties uh, that could challenge a child and their family. So lots of things to consider here when we discuss a severe or moderate NDD. All of this is also clouded by the fact that there's not, it's not just about gestational age, and we all know this, because that is an imprecise uh, factor. There's always plus or minus a few days, sometimes more. Every other, there's a lot of other factors that count in uh, assessing uh, prognosis for both survival and long-term um, impairment or disability. In this paper from Tyson in 2008, where he looked at data from over 4,500 uh, infants born um, under 26 weeks or under 25 weeks in the NICHG uh, research uh, network, one can see that the male-female factor and the small or large for gestational age had a huge impact or huge influence on uh, survival and survival without profound impairment. You'll notice that the number of survival without profound impairment seems low here it's because the the two outcomes are confounded together. It's not 27% of the survivors. You have to survive without profound to be uh, in that category. So female, singleton, multiple steroids have a huge influence. And you'll see the three examples that we drew from uh, the data is that two 25-week infants may have a very different uh, outlook based on these other factors. So, the perinatal factors have a huge, can have a huge influence on the, the, the outcome or the prediction of the outcome. 
One more feature or com uh, question or factor that we hear a lot about is quality of life, and that is not an easy task to uh, comment on. There have been lots of cohorts. We have done a review of the literature. Um, many of the cohorts are older, uh, and so uh, the relevance now of, of the experience and lived experiences of uh, adults or teenagers who were resuscitated and stabilized and cared for in the 80s and 90s is questionable. However, the general message is that those born extremely preterm in their parents tend to view their quality of life as pretty good and often very similar to those born at term. There are, all, however, survivors who do quote their quality of life as very poor and some who are unable to answer because of severe disability. This slide shows one example of a cohort from Australia where survivors between 23 and 27 weeks essentially did not have a huge difference uh, in their um, assessed, self-assessed quality of life and it was uh, very high um, in all uh, across the gestational ages. And lastly, but very importantly, uh, the social familial factors. These are non-medical factors that are actually quite important in decision making, but often not addressed. Uh, these include, and this is not an exhaustive list, but family structure. Is this the first child or is this the fifth child? How many parents are going to be looking after this child? How close and involved is the extended family. What are the, the parents' religious beliefs and faith? What, are their, where is the, what is their cultural and social background? What is important to them, their values and their perspective? Sometimes there are economic and geographic factors, where they live, what's their income, how can they afford certain things or not, and then the, the whole question of life experience, what they have gone through, this is something that physicians and healthcare practitioners do not know, but that parents know about themselves or can be helped to, um, to express better. All that to say that there's a lot of uncertainty in this complex area. So how do we best support families in making decisions for these infants? So I'm going to step back in here and start with introducing patient number two, and this is Jordan. And he weighed 343 grams and was born at 23 weeks and three days gestation. His parents knew his prognosis was very guarded due to factors uh, complicating the pregnancy, but they felt they had to, in quotes, give him a chance. So resuscitation measures were attempted for five minutes, but there were never any signs of life. And with his parents present, and intensive care measures were actually stopped, and Jordan received palliative care measures, as you can see, such as being held uh, and warmed. Now I want to speak now about the method of engaging with parents uh, that we advocate for in the CPS statement. Shared decision making is where two or more parties who are considered to be morally equivalent uh, participate in the decision making process. And there has to be uh, information shared, values shared, uh, as without that there can't be a really shared decision. And communication skills need to be excellent and engaging uh, with each party uh, must occur. And then you hope through that that there'll be mutual agreement on a final decision. And the outcome in terms of parent and healthcare practitioner satisfaction with the decision is important because, for example, if the patient has notable regret after a shared decision, then it may mean that in fact uh, it was not shared, even if that patient chose it with support at first. So just to keep uh, introducing this idea a bit further, so where is this uh, useful, this shared decision-making approach, and why are we advocating it? Well, it's good in difficult decisions where there's more than one reasonable treatment option, which hopefully we've shown today for what those options are, or there's uncertainty, which again I hope we've shown uh, with regards to the best treatment option. And really probably most importantly that the decision is preference sensitive. Where preference sensitive means that two reasonable, fully informed people with their different values, life experience, religion, etc., could end up choosing two different options, with neither of them, of those two people, being considered right or wrong. Now, the exact degree of involvement uh, of each party will vary in each individual scenario, but one should rarely, if ever, 
end up with either a fully paternalistic uh, model where the doctor decides alone or the fully informed choice where the family decides completely alone and without real support. So the healthcare practitioner needs to determine the parent's preference for participation in the decision-making process in order to really proceed well with this shared decision-making. Now, during this engaging process, uh, each party is recognized as an expert, and both sides have to share information. So, sort of broadly speaking, the medical team, you know, sort of shown here on the left in the slide, uh, needs to share about the options, about information that's available, the data. They need to discuss the pros and cons of these options and the limitations of the information and data. They have to talk about the feasibility of the option in each unique situation. And they will need to share their own values, potentially, regarding the options uh, as required. Not in every case, but there may be some. And generally, it would not be done early in the process to avoid bias. Also, they may need to give an actual recommendation. But again, this should only be done after exploring the reasons behind why a family believes they need a specific recommendation uh, from their healthcare practitioner to make a decision. And the parents, uh, or the family, uh, broadly, needs to share things like knowledge and understanding regarding the options, the information, and data that's presented to them. And they really must share their values related to the choice at hand. What is behind their reasoning? What are, what are they thinking about? What's making them contemplate one choice more than the other? And finally, they do have to share their preferences. So what do parents want? Well, Katarina Staub, the past president of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, along with her co-authors, beautifully wrote about the perspective of parents themselves. And these are some of the highlights, though I encourage you uh, to read the whole article. Uh, so they say parents want differing involvement in decision-making. Some will want more support, others will want less, and as I mentioned, some may need a recommendation, others won't. Parents want information that is balanced and accurate with the level of detail individualized. Some are big picture people, some are detail people. Parents definitely want good communication. The words you use matter. Do you use the name of the baby if the baby has been given a name yet? And parents want trust, and this trust is developed through the healthcare practitioner being knowledgeable, freely providing all truthful information, and showing that you have the infant's best interest in mind. And it comes through wanting to discuss values with the parents and deciding what's important to them, and perhaps disclosing what's important to you. So to further stress the importance of this parental perspective, we actually involve parents in the statement's development process through a national consultation uh, that Dr. Lemire is going to describe in a bit more detail in a moment. And these are the six key themes that came from our parent consultation. Uh, they spoke about wanting the healthcare practitioner to speak about the positives of prematurity, not just negatives. They want to be given realistic hope, not excessive hope or not none at all. They want uh, us to show acceptance of the gray in the decision-making process. They want support to be provided. And they always want us to focus beyond gestation. You know, no infant is just a number. And they really noted the importance of experience and that one has to be uh, careful about who walks into a room to speak with parents about these life and death decisions. And how do we meet uh, these needs and wants that I've described? Well, we really do believe it can come through uh, well-performed shared decision-making in the vast majority of cases. And as I've already mentioned, excellent communication uh, is needed in order to engage in the shared decision-making process and make it a success. Table three in the statement provides many tips that have come from a review of the literature and through a practical teaching program that we have here uh, in Ottawa. And we believe it's in line with what most parents will desire during uh, one of these antenatal consultations. Again, I reiterate that communication will improve with experience and that that needs to be considered and that we have to consider how do we practice both experienced practitioners and uh, less experienced practitioners, and how do we train our learners? And that's something that needs to be uh, continued to be an important uh, part of the agenda as you move forward in working with families and making these decisions. 
So this time I'm going to let you enjoy a look out east of Santa Barbara, California uh, as we move into the final 10 minutes or so of the talk. So how do we apply the statement into practice? The statement proposes a framework to follow, ideally over a period of time, to determine options, explore them with parents, and help, make, help them make a choice that is aligned with their values and preferences. We're not going to solve anything today or make it perfect anytime soon. This is really a framework. So the suggestion is first to, to estimate the likelihood of survival and NDD based on all available information, all known prognostic factors for this particular patient. And then recognize that there is a certain degree of prognostic uncertainty, which may be higher or lower depending on each case. Then one must determine whether there is a usual approach to care given the estimated prognosis. And if there is not, and there are several options, then we present the parents with these options um, for them to ponder and look at their socio-familial factors and look at the medical factors as well and help them make a decision. So this is a figure that tries to come get us through this process. So assess the, everything you know. Look at the chance or the risk of survival or the mice that you anticipate. Look at the risk of moderate to severe NDD. Make an estimation. Are both options, intensive care, palliative care, usual in these circumstances? Yes, go through SVM. If there actually is a usual suggested level of care, we suggest that that be recommended and that some parents may accept the recommendations and some parents may not. And if they don't, um, one may, depending on the circumstance, go through a conflict resolution, second opinion, ethics consultation. And then given the lack of moral authority, uh, it may be quite uh, acceptable to allow parents to choose this non-usual care, or perhaps not. And we need to uh, work our way through this difficult situation, which is really outside the scope uh, of the statement because uh, it has to be individualized. Table four on this slide, what you see here is uh, it, it proposes some guidance regarding when to suggest palliative care, when to suggest intensive care, and when to offer both. Now, this is the product of months of discussions, consultation, profound reflection. It did not look like this at the first go. It was reviewed by a whole lot of stakeholders. And in the statement that you may or may not have read, there's a far right column that describes examples for each different level, and it's coming up in the next slide. So what we suggest is that when the healthcare practitioner anticipates an extremely high likelihood of mortality or severe NDD, that palliative care is suggested or recommended. Now, one must recognize that it is extremely rare that you would reach this extremely high likelihood of severe NDD. It is much more the mortality or the, severe, the high risk of mortality that drives this estimation. On the other hand, if the healthcare practitioner determines that the, the, there is a low likelihood of mortality or moderate to severe NDD, that intensive care is recommended. If it's in between, then both options should be put on the table. Again, lack of moral authority on the suggested level of care may mean that some parents may choose a non-recommended option after informed uh, discussion. The right-hand side of Table 4 shows some clinical examples that usually meet the risk estimation that we're talking about. So extremely high likelihood of mortality or severe NDD. Infant born at 22 weeks gestational age given the extremely high likelihood of mortality, we think it meets that classification. Similarly, an infant born at 24 weeks who has an estimated fetal weight of under 400 grams, we think could meet that category. Um, moderate to high, you have babies between 23 and 24 weeks, or a baby at 25 weeks with signs of fetal anemia or poor placental flow and severe IUGR. On the other hand, low likelihood, um, baby born at 25 weeks without additional risk factors, or even perhaps a baby born in the late 24th week, in a, in, well grown with 
full course of steroids born in a tertiary care center. Note again these additional risk factors that must be taken into consideration when one makes this uh, estimation of prognosis. Small for gestational age, absence of antenatal corticosteroids, multiple gestations, earlier in the week of gestation, birth outside of, the, of a tertiary center, chorioamnionitis, and anomalies present on ultrasound. All of these increase uh, your risk. So the goal is to move away from gestational age, but gestational age needs to be taken into consideration with all these other factors. The national consultation process deviated from the usual CPS uh, process. Uh, what, what was different this time around is that besides having myself and Greg draft several drafts of the statement for review by the fetus and newborn committee. It went simultaneously, it went internally to the bioethics and community pediatric uh, committee, and also at the same time to the SOGC um, and to the College of Physi Family Physicians of Canada. Now, normally this would have happened one after the other. And also at the same time, um, we invited 26 NICU clinical directors to review the guidelines, 11 of them uh, provided a response. They were provided uh, appraisal, guideline appraisal tools. We invited rural and remote practitioners, five out of eight return questionnaires, four specific questions plus free text, and four out of 16 parents return questionnaires uh, with free text. All of this information, all the feedback, the themes were incorporated into uh, another draft that went back to the fetus and newborn committee uh, and, with, and then further revisions, and then it went to the board. And it, it was finally approved in September, uh, and it went into press in December, and we now have the version uh, online. So this uh, is Eva, and she's uh, the final patient you're going to meet today. And she weighed 400 grams and was born at 22 weeks and four days gestational age about 18 months ago. A recommendation prenatally uh, was made for palliative care, but the parents chose differently. Her mother received steroids, and she was actually the second baby uh, at our institution in the 22-week gestational age window who received early intensive care. Now, this only came after three years of dedicated local work on a project titled Shared Decision-Making for the Extremely Preterm Infant. And this included education and training of many team members about the use of shared decision making, uh, including uh, tools for that, uh, such as a decision aid that's been developed and decision coaching. And also, there's a develop been the development of a specific postnatal care bundle for the most immature babies. So in this photo, Eva is seven days old and she's looking quite well. And uh, the team actually sensed that she just might survive, uh, but she sadly ended up dying at 17 days of age from gram-negative sepsis. And this is clearly uh, an undesirable outcome. But I want to share a quote from the parents that deals more with the process of the decision-making and the care provided that started antenatally and continued postnatally. And the quote reads, the NICU team's efforts and compassion will always be appreciated and the NICU team will always be in our hearts. And we'd like to end our talk here on this important note. We desire for all parents to have personalized care where those caring for them and their baby are appreciated for their great efforts and compassion, regardless of the exact decision made or whether the desired outcome for the infant is perfectly reached. Thank you very much, and uh, we're open to questions and comments. All right. Thank you very much for a great uh, great presentation. I mean, that really covered a lot of ground, and as the title suggests, there is no simple answer, but you certainly raised lots of the issues, and uh, and I think it certainly was very will be very helpful for those who have participated today. Uh, so it is uh, your chance to ask some uh, ask any questions that you want. Just go ahead and type them into the into the question box. Um, the first question that came in was around when you were talking about sort of you mentioned the team approach to these conversations. There was just a, sort of a question around. Um, 
who typically participates in these conversations and is it different whether these conversations are happening when it's an expected uh, or a high high likelihood of a preterm birth and there's time to have these conversations versus uh, when it's closer to to the birth or more of a an, an emergent situation uh, like is it typically a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a physician is there typically others involved a nurse a social worker others involved is and is it different whether when you have time to have the conversation versus not yeah, that's a very good question, and I mean, I'll point out one key recommendation. They're not numbered in the CPS uh, statement, uh, but what it says is the maternal fetal medicine specialist, neonatologist, nurse caring for the mother, and other healthcare practitioners involved in the circle of care must communicate directly with each other and with parents to ensure clear understanding of the management plan, avoid conflicting information and enhance care. Ideally, such conversations should take place at the bedside to allow all pertinent information to inform the decision-making process. So I guess that's to say, Doug, you know, that the goal is, is at some point uh, to have the key major, let's call them the involved healthcare practitioners, and also the parents uh, and extended family of that uh, those parents and the support people, that they're all in the room together at some point uh, to make the uh, decision that's best uh, for that family. And uh, so we try to do that. It's certainly not 100% successful. People's schedules, different busyness. Uh, so there's often lots of revisiting and going back uh, and forth with the parents, which is key. And yes, clearly when there's time is limited, baby is going to be born shortly, often it might simply be the neonatologist being in there briefly and then the maternal fetal medicine specialist being there briefly. Again, there's gray in the process. Uh, we can't uh, have a perfect scenario every time. Have ever seen a role of sort of peer support uh, in this as far as uh, other parents who have a, a sort of a peer support role within the NICU that participate in these conversations, either having gone through this or having had a premature infant that has survived? That has certainly been a, suge a strong suggestion by the uh, Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. Um, the peer support is not available in all centers. It is uh, flourishing in some centers in Toronto. It is starting in other centers. I think that would be of extreme good value. Um, but yeah, it is, a, let's say, a, an objective for the, for the future. And I would just add that we do try to promote a tour of the NICU for parents to get to walk through and see it if they can prior to the potential delivery of their extremely preterm infant. And we definitely do have strong links with social work who then has strong links with parents who have been through a lived experience in the NICU and definitely there are communication points that can happen. So we don't have a peer support process here in Ottawa, but there is a process that could result in parents uh, who've had lived experience meet prenatally with parents who are expecting they might have to live the experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're just, we just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago our Life with a Preterm Baby series that we did with uh, the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation and, and out of the six episodes, most of them had some sort of peer support component. Most of the presenters were from Mount Sinai or Sunnybrook in Toronto, so that might explain why there, there was a constant conversation around peer support, so that might explain the, that kind of question today. But, um, so, uh, again, just going back to the audience, uh, if, uh, if there are any other questions, we do have another about approximately 10 minutes left. If there are other questions, please do uh, do get them into the question box. Um, we'll give everyone just a few more few more seconds to see if there's any other questions typed in, and if, if not, we may wrap up a little bit early. And, uh, and before we... Uh, we did have a question come in from Anastasia, who's asking. She's she's trying to. She says they're trying to reach a consensus currently in her institution. Uh, the obstetricians are concerned about offering therapies in 22 weeks of at 22 weeks of gestation, for example, antenatal BMTZ or magnesium, uh, when large organizations make strong recommendations against this. Do you have any thoughts on that? Let's just say it was uh, it was not an easy task to uh, rally everyone, and it takes discussions and and we we did not uh, create our working group to promote resuscitating babies at 22 weeks, but more to 
make sure that the information provided to parents was truthful, equal, value neutral, and shared between everyone and to involve them in the process. And it is in fact some parents who have requested that we attempt stabilizing their infants at 22 weeks. And the first three or four did not survive, but we learned a lot from these infants. And uh, we have one who went home with uh, zero severe morbidity. Uh, the future will tell how she does in the long run, but uh, she had a pretty smooth uh, course. So yes, there is, there is concern, there is fear. Uh, what we advocate locally is when parents have made a conscious and informed decision to that they wish for an attempt at intensive care that the best possible prenatal care is also provided. Now that we stay away from mode of delivery discussion because that's a whole other topic era and we are not promoting cesarean sections at this age because of, of the, the risk, but certainly steroids and magnesium sulfate, we try to uh, discuss that with our colleagues in MFM. And I think that now that they see that they're, we're not flooded with 22-week infants and that we have actually had one survivor and there's another one who's gonna go home in the next few weeks, I think that it's kind of reassuring them. Do you have anything to add, Greg? No, I think just to state the importance of, again, individualized care, we, even at 24 weeks or 25 weeks uh, or 23 weeks, there could be a reflex to give antenatal corticosteroids, and that may not be appropriate if a parent hasn't made a decision yet. So we've had cases where a, m a mother has received antenatal steroids at, say, 24 weeks and three days, but she's had no consultation yet, and it's very clear that that family does not want early intensive care and they want palliative care provided, well, then that mother should not have received a painful injection with not many side effects, but the potential for side effects. So I guess I would like to promote out of that individualized care, but certainly uh, the provision of antenatal corticosteroids prior to the delivery, ideally within the seven day window of uh, pre, you know, before the delivery, seven days or less, to be provided should be given if a baby is going to receive early intensive care, if at all possible. Talking about the um, number of parents that provided input when you were talking about sort of the the broader consultative process that you went through to develop these guidelines, she's identifying that only four parents provided input. I think in the slide it said four out of six. There were 16 that were uh, asked to submit, and then only four of the 16 did. Does that seem low as far as the number of parents who were able to participate, or can you provide us some context around that number? Is it high or low? I mean, there were a lot that were invited. Uh, we had input from the president of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, and locally we had three further parents that take part of our working group on these on these things. Um, not such an easy thing to get input from people, but what I have to say is that the the the, the comments from the parents were all very concordant. The message was, we really like your tables and the fact that parents get a voice. We really like that you're asking for um, experienced practitioners to talk to us and that just it's not just about gestational age. It was very, very uh, encouraging and uh, they were all saying the same thing. And I think I would just add that certainly there we would always want more input from everybody. You want to hear from as many people as possible in this preference sensitive decision making area, but uh, we did our best, I guess I could say, and uh, there is a commentary that will be published in press with the statement when it's published in press in the next month or so, and it talks about the limitations of our consultation process and how could it maybe be improved to, for example, get more parents' opinion and more pediatricians' opinions and more NICU centers opinions. All right. Yes, and certainly a, a small number of parents in general who would have had the experience to respond, so certainly a, a challenge for sure. Um, the next question is uh, asking if you can clarify the rate of severe uh, neurodevelopmental disorder risk at 23 and 24 weeks. Is, she says table two shows higher risk in 24 weeks than 23 weeks. Is 
Well, it depends on the, I think it depends greatly on the number of, uh, of babies. That's one of them, 73 versus 175. Um, there was some degree of heterogeneity suggesting that it depended a little bit of where, which cohort, which country, where you were, and, uh, and how you did. They're not, that, that's one of the things, they're not absolute reasons, right? They, they're not absolute numbers. There's always a wiggle around them. So I would take the 23 weeks, yeah, with a grain of salt because the, the confidence interval is, uh, is quite wide. And even at 24 weeks, the confidence intervals are, are quite wide. So. so they all overlap. Yeah. And that's why, as Dr. Lemire mentioned, there's no statistical significant difference between these four weeks that we represent here with the limitations that are there. So you could actually just say something like, well, it looks like it's around 15 to 20% for all three, instead of saying, you know, 24 weeks is worse than 23 yeah. weeks. That would not be an accurate statement. All right. And I think with that, uh, that is the last of our questions. So uh, we are just about out of time. So maybe we will just, uh, what we can do is we can hand it back over to Dr. Lemire and Dr. Moore uh, for any, any closing sort of messages, any uh, 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 key messages that you'd like to uh, leave the audience with before we wrap up. So maybe we can start with you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Moore. I think I would uh, speak to the importance about the experience factor that one learns a lot through doing more and more antenatal consultations and sees the varied opinions, sees the importance of parental involvement, sees the importance of each healthcare provider and how they can influence the decision. So I guess my, my overall comment would be, you know, there, there is no perfect answer, definitely no simple answer, uh, but I think one simple part is that you need to communicate well and you need to involve parents and acknowledge that you don't definitively know the right or wrong answer when you're doing these. So there's no simple answer, but I think in a way there's a simple answer to the process. Good communication, involve the parents, acknowledge that we don't know uh, what's best in each and every situation. All right, uh, Dr. Lemire, anything from you? Any anything you'd like to close off with before we end? I'm thinking. Um, I think that this whole process. I've I've been working with on this topic for what four years now with Greg. That um, you have to keep an open mind and be um, be careful about presenting both sides of the of the data and the story to parents. Not just the death, but the survival. Be be a bit neutral and and listen and ask them. What's important for you? What would you like to know now? Where are we going with this? So that they actually can drive the, the discussion more than us just saying what we think is important um, and making it clear to them that there, there's actually a decision to make and choices to consider right from the get-go so that they, uh, they think about that. Because we found out in a pilot study of, of a decision aid that the majority of parents did not even know they had choices to make. They had no idea, uh, even after meeting an obstetrician, that this is what that was going to be the nature of our discussion. All right. So if any, I think with that we'll wrap it up. I mean, certainly have given us a lot to think about as the audience. A very interesting sort of topic, a, a challenging time for for parents and families and the clinicians that have to negotiate these conversations with them and 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 sort of walk them through this process. But uh, you've certainly given the audience uh, a very a lot to think about. Lots of uh, comments in the uh, in the in the question box. Uh, Thank you for this ex excellent presentation. So. And with that, I think we will wrap up. Uh, uh, we do our webinars, uh, as uh, many of you know, every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Next week, we will be taking a break, but uh, in two weeks, we'll be coming back. And it's always great when you can join us live as the, con the comments and questions really enrich the discussion. But when you can't, we do, as of course, always record these sessions and make them available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network. So nothing next week, but in two weeks, on April 26th, we will be welcoming Dr. Yves Dubay, a medical anthropologist working at the Quebec National Institute of Public Health and the Chute Quebec to talk about vaccine hesit hesitancy to vaccine resilience, and this will be about building and sustaining vaccination up 
acceptance and uptake, uh, vaccine hesitancy being a topic that many are familiar with, but we'll also illustrate the importance of maintaining confidence in and demand for vaccination using an innovative approach around the concept of vaccine resilience. And then following that on May 3rd, we will be uh, hearing about the recently developed Canadian pediatric nursing standards, uh, ensuring high quality nursing care for children across Canada. We'll be welcoming, doc, uh, welcoming Bonnie Fleming Carroll from SickKids in Toronto. Uh, the, nursing, the Canadian pediatric nursing standards will serve as a framework for high quality pediatric nursing care delivery across all sectors and provide consistency in describing expertise and scope of practice of a pediatric nurse, as well as inform pediatric nurse education and national certification processes. From acute care to community and from Aboriginal to immigrant health, these standards will ultimately guide and ensure consistent high quality nursing care for all Canadian children. So uh, be sure to uh, check out uh, that webinar and that will be again in three weeks. So uh, once again, nothing next week, uh, but in the next couple weeks, we will have some great stuff. So uh, we look forward to seeing everyone then. Bye everybody.